No. Great. So welcome. Um, welcome, Mary, and welcome everyone who's joining us this morning, my time, and afternoon, your time, um, and wherever you are. Um, I'm just going to share a little bit about myself and VitaCycle, um, and then we'll get into Mary and all the work, the amazing work you're doing. Um, so I'm Abby Rose. I am the CEO of VitaCycle. Um, and at VitaCycle, we're committed to building ecology, profitability, and beauty on farms around the world. Um, we make apps that support observation as a key tool for understanding what works on a specific farm or vineyard. Um, many of you may already use or be familiar with our app Sector Mentor, which is specifically for vineyards. Um, it makes it easy to predict yields, monitor ripeness, but also understand soil health and biodiversity um, and track vineyard activities block by block. So in essence, Sector Mentor is about supporting regenerative viticulture. Um, and then through our work, we have the privilege of being in contact with some amazing regenerative advisors, practitioners, um, and, and this is how we met the brilliant Dr. Mary Retelek. Um, uh, Mary actually first caught our attention online because um, we saw that Mary was offering viticultural services, but also that she described herself as an agroecologist. And not many people in the world of viticulture talk about agroecology at all, actually. Um, and so, and then once we connected with Mary um, and we learned about the Eco Vineyards program, it became clear that Mary really is one of the most experienced and ecologically minded viticulturists we've met. Um, so really excited that you're here today, Mary. Um, and I guess that's, you know, the regenerative viticulture series really is about providing a space to bring together some of the, you know, the brilliant stuff happening around the world. So connecting up conversations, sharing knowledge, and highlighting the work of Mary and other brilliant innovators um, to help everyone take a more regenerative approach. So that's really a context of why we're here today. Um, so just a note to say, you know, if you have any questions, please ask them in the Q&A area. Um, and yeah, it, if you ask it there, it'll be visible to everyone and you can upvote someone else's question using the thumbs up button if you think it's a good question. And, and we'll look at those. Uh, about 15 minutes, for about 15 minutes at the end. Okay, so to get into things, um, first up, Mary, I would love, well, welcome. And uh, I'd love if you could maybe just share a bit about yourself and your background so everyone knows more about you. Sure, thanks, Abby, and um, thank you for that really kind introduction. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here. and. Thanks for all the amazing work that you're doing uh, in this space to get the message out about um, regenerative viticulture and also uh, agroecological practices. Uh, I'm a third generation viticulturalist uh, and I'm also, as you mentioned, an agroecologist. So I get the best of both worlds. Um, I've got a particular interest in native insectary plants and also the wildlife found in association. And that wildlife can often contribute to bio control of insect pests uh, in not only vineyards, but also production systems also. Um, I'm based in the Adelaide Hills in South Australia. So for your international guests, uh, I'm in the, say, the centre of Australia and right at the bottom. Uh, I work throughout Australia and uh, sometimes internationally as well via my business, Retalic Viticulture. And I founded and run a program called Eco Vineyards, uh, where we work with viticulturalists throughout Australia um, to provide an ecological approach to growing wine grapes. Um, I've also got a very small vineyard comprising bush vines uh, planted amongst some native insectary plants in a natural bush setting. Um, but most of my time is spent on the road working closely with wine growers, running events and also writing uh, educational materials. Um, you can say my passion for, for ecology and working, I say, with the intelligence of nature and harmony with nature um, probably started when I left school and I actually had the chance to study ecology and then viticulture came later on. Um, I grew up in a vineyard, so for me, um, coming back into the wine community felt very natural. Um, the first vineyard I managed about 20 years ago, I applied my initial training in ecology and it felt entirely intuitive to incorporate uh, native insectary plants to provide habitat for predators, um, including arthropods. So that's just a fancy term to say insects and spiders, uh, microbats, and also insectivorous birds. 
Um, and perhaps it was a, um, a bit of a, a radical practice back then when, you know, monoculture really did rule uh, and there was a pretty conservative approach to growing wine grapes. Um, so unfortunately, all of these magnificent, magnificent insectary plants uh, that I um, put into this vineyard were sprayed out when the vineyard changed hands. <laughs> so I was pretty grumpy. <laughs> I, um, I decided to embark on doing PhD studies just to prove the benefits of these species and so that people would listen to what I had to say. So um, I, um, you know, kind of finished the PhD in about uh, 2019 and, and I was able to secure some funding through the National Land Care Program. We started the Eco Vineyards Program in conjunction with the Wine Grape Council of South Australia and now that program uh, has grown into a national program funded by Wine Australia. So um, there's quite, wow. I guess, a his history there. Yeah, amazing. And I love that. Uh, yeah, 30 years in five minutes. It's amazing to hear it all. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I can only imagine the, uh, the utter, like, frustration of those insectary plants being sprayed out. I mean, unbelievable, uh, but I guess very believable in its time. So um, yeah, really ap appreciate your ongoing commitment. And um, I guess one of the things that is so exciting about your work, um, for me anyway, is that you're both a practitioner. And as you just said, you did this PhD and, uh, you know, you're a published scientist. You've, you've done the work uh, to really bring scientific evidence to back up the work you're doing, your ecolo ecological approach. So maybe you could tell me a bit more about that research into insectary plants and, and what, what's that about? Sure. Um, so I completed a PhD in viticulture and also plant protection. So very much had an ecology focus uh, looking at those native insectary plants and the arthropods found in association. Um, so, yeah, during that time I was sampling plants and I was, you know, looking at bugs and, um, you know, looking at what that would tell me in terms of benefits from a vineyard perspective. And in terms of the hard science, you know, we found that um, functional biodiversity or the capacity for biocontrol of insect pests increased by about 3.2%. Um, so more than three times when native evergreen shrubs are planted uh, in the vicinity of grapevines. So that was pretty cool. And part mm. of that is, um, you know, we're really wanting to get away from this idea of a monoculture, which is a really fragile and um, poorly buffered system where perhaps problem weeds and insects often dominate and regular interventions quite often are required to produce, you know, a crop. So mm. conversely, what we're wanting to do is move towards a polyculture, um, which has really good functional biodiversity um, and also soil health. The system has greater resilience. It can rebound more quickly after disruption, including, say, extreme weather events. And it's able to self-regulate with this, you know, less intervention um, mm. and potentially growers can save, you know, time and resources. So um, biodiversity is obviously the variety of plants and animal life. Each species has a niche in the ecosystem. And um, so we're not so worried about what the system looks like, but how well it functions. Got it. Yeah. And so I loved when we were talking a bit about your research, you told me um kind of some of the relationships between species and, and the importance of some of those insectary plants in order to provide uh, the protection for the plants. And you gave the example of the wallaby grass, brown lacewings and wolf spiders working together. Uh, maybe mm, you should sure. just share a bit more about that example. Yeah, um, perhaps I should also explain what an insectary plant is. So we, uh, yeah, we kind good of idea. <laughs> We talk about uh, an acronym called SNAP, which stands for uh, shelter, nectar, uh, alternative prey, and also pollen. So they're the types of attributes that we're looking for. And what I do is I um, select plants that are native to an area. Um, they were here, obviously, before we modified the landscape. And um, they will tend to fit into what we call a, a pre-European plant community, which you might find interesting from you know, your European perspective. Yep. Um, or we also have different terminology, say in New South Wales, we might call them plant community types, or in Victoria, we'd call it say an ecological vegetation class. And uh, where I live, uh, it's my particular plant community, the stringy bark or a eucalyptus oblique open forest. So I'm drawing um, you know, species from that plant community. And the species I'm gonna talk about today are part of that um, plant community that's local to where I live as well. 
Um, so wallaby grasses, uh, the botanical name is Rutitisperma. Um, we're particularly interested in a very low growing species called need wallaby grass. And we can plant that in the mid row or even the undervine area as well. And uh, it's a native perennial grass and it provides habitat um, and breeding sites for brown lacewing larvae and also wolf spiders, um, in particular with a range of predatory ground beetles, shield bugs, earwigs, and also assassin, bu assassin bugs. So they help control like brown moth, which can say overwinter on broadleaf weeds like plantain and cake wheat. And um, their eggs are easily predated by a range of predatory arthropods at that ground level. Um, and also shield bugs have these uh, piercing and sucking mouth parts. So they'll suck the guts out of, you know, the young caterpillars <laughs> as they, you know, if they get past the, the um, egg hatching stage. And um, I found at least 37 different types of predatory arthropods and about 100 different morphe species. So that's just a technical term to say they look different. They look visually different. We didn't necessarily know what they were, but we know what their function was and we gave them a number. Um, so, you know, we're interested in, you know, which species are predators, which are, um, say, pest species. And also then we have a category just called other, and that includes detritivores that help break down organic matter, or they might provide prey for predators. They're just passing through. Um, so from a scientific point of view, I found a net increase of predator richness of about 27% when wallaby grasses are planted in combination with, uh, say, grapevines. And it just shows this amazing richness of diversity that we can get at ground level. Mm. Um, and I also, I also looked at um, shrubs, so green evergreen shrubs like uh, sweet Bessaria, which is Bessaria spinosa, um, also common name of blackthorn in New South Wales or Christmas bush in South Australia, and also another species called prickly tea tree, which is Leptospermum continentale. And they, again, um, uh, provide fantastic floral benefits for an extended period um, from late winter right through until probably late summer if you plant them concurrently. And um, they provide habitat for a diversity, again, of uh, predatory arthropods. I found at least 65 species. So there's a lot going on. And importantly, uh, fantastic habitat for parasitic wasps. And they provide mm -hmm. biocontrol of, say, in uh, grapevine scale. Uh, mm -hmm. mealybugs, light brown moth, assassin bugs, damsel bugs, green and brown lacewings. Yeah, there was heaps in there. Wow. So kind of in essence, in my head, what I'm hearing, or an insectary plant is really like, um, it's kind of the infrastructure for this insect life, this insect ecosystem that's operating in the vineyard um, that we so often forget about. Um, and, and that's how we often end up in a a monocultural situation or a, a, an extreme disease, high disease, high pest pressure situation is when we don't have this infrastructure, this insectary that, plant in infrastructure. Okay. That's right. Yeah, we're looking for a diversity of plants that overlap in flowering periods. So there's not a what we call a resource bottleneck like you might get in the northern hemisphere where you have a lot of, say, deciduous plants and they all leave their, lose their leaves at the same time. That's mm. one benefit we have in the Southern Hemisphere is many of our native plants are evergreen. And, um, yeah, it's also a fantastic way for us to showcase a unique Australia, uh, Aust Aussie flora. Um, it not, not only looks great, but it's functional and it helps us stand out in a crowded international marketplace. Um, so, mm. yeah, there's lots of benefits to these plants. Mm. Yeah, and I think what's interesting also for me is that because my focus has been a lot on soil health, you know, I've always thought about diversity because it had diverse root structures and it was diverse microbial life below ground. But actually, I hadn't even been considering this insect, you know, this multi-layered insect-based benefit above ground. So that's really, yeah, thanks for sharing and amazing to hear about that world. Um, yeah. I guess, yeah, one thing just quickly, um, you know, I, I've heard you make a distinction between insectary plants versus pollinator plants versus native plants. Um, obviously, sometimes there's overlap, but maybe could you just uh, clear up that distinction? What is the difference? And then also, you know, what's the most important thing for people to understand about those in order to work with them in their location? Because, uh, yeah. Sure. Uh, they're essentially the same, but what we're looking for is the, the quality of those 
resources that those plants provide, whether it's uh, nectar and ne or pollen. So nectar is required to give, it's like a sugar hit. <laughs> Can you imagine having a hoverfly and all the energy required to stay up in the air? You know, it needs to have energy, but they also need to have access to pollen, which provides fecundity of uh, like how many eggs that they can produce and how healthy they are. They are. And when we talk about pollinators, I think, you know, we kind of just naturally think about butterflies and bees. But of course, there's lots of species like birds, bats, flies, uh, moths, wasps, uh, small mammals that can all act as pollinators. And I'm particularly interested in the range of benefits and secretary plants can provide, um, you know, in terms of a broad diversity of uh, the arthropods, the insects and the spiders, and uh, the functional benefits that we get not only from pollination perspective, not so we of um, not so critical in grapevines because they're mm -hmm. hermaphrodites and quite often wind or self pollinated. Um, but yeah, there's a much broader discussion for us to have if we're talking about the desirable attributes of say insectary plants. We're looking at their attractiveness to predators. Um, we want a real diversity of um, you know flowering times, as I mentioned earlier, but flower shapes as well. Um, some flowers, um, you know, you've got to have, insects need to have very long mouth parts to be able to tap into the goodies. Um, we want to have an early and long or overlapping flowering period uh, at key times throughout the growing season, especially coinciding in the lead up to when grapevines flower, mm. um, just at the very end of spring, early summer. Um, those species, we want to be able to outcompete weeds but have low potential to be a weed, uh, have low establishment costs, um, be naturally adapted to the site, have low ongoing maintenance and um, also have low potential to host pest species. So there's a lot to think about out there. And, um, you know, we're, we're interested in different height strata as well. Um, when we look at plant communities, we're interested in the tall trees, but mostly we're interested in the shrubs because they're going to be most appropriate around a vineyard say adjacent to a strainer post or uh, bolstering a shelter belt or ground covers. And they can be uh, a whole range of different species, uh, grasses, forbs, which are flowering plants, low growing woody plants. It might be strap leaf plants, uh, which are really tough, um, bulbs, lilies, climbing plants. So um, diversity is the key. And um, what we're always looking for is to cover bare soil. So 100% functional ground cover and active roots, 100% of the time where possible. And um, we know that the plants that we select, um, that we plant above ground will have an impact, like you mentioned, on the microbes below ground and also earthworms and so forth. So it's all interconnected. Mm. That's the lovely thing about nature and ecology is uh, every species has a place and they're all really important. Mm, totally. Um, having said that, they are all really important, but do you have any favorites? <laughs> do you have any favorite <laughs> invertebrates um, in the vineyard and, and, you know, why are they your favorite or why are they important? Uh, I do. Um, they have their own personality sometimes when you're out there looking at them on a regular basis. <laughs> I haven't mentioned spiders much, but I found about 17 different families of spiders and some of those species are you know, active predators like jumping spiders. They're tiny and cute with big kind of eyes and a flat head and they're, they're quite friendly. They'll sit there with their palps and, you know, kind of, you know, sit there and be really curious. Uh -huh. um, you know, you'll have other species that will also be ambush, um, you know, kind of predators like wolf spiders on the ground and they have their own little home. And, you know, if you put a, a torch into their hole, you can see their eyes reflecting back at you. So that can be a bit freaky when you look at them under a microscope. Totally. Um, you can have, you know, really, you know, lazy um, species like you would see orb spiders. You've got to keep your mouth closed as you go through the vineyard on the ATV to make sure you don't, you know, get one in your mouth. <laughs> We've got a species called um, the bird dropping spider. Or in Australia, we just call it the bird poo spider, um, which looks like, as you can imagine, uh, a bird dropping. And it does that to mimic um, bird droppings to avoid predators, mainly birds. And what it does is it stays motionless on the web during the day. It hunts usually at night. It hangs down from a silken thread and it releases these pheromones which mimic the smells um, released by female moths. And when a, a moth comes near, the spider will catch it with its big front, you know, four, four legs. So, you know, that's got its own interesting way of doing things. Uh, I love assassin bugs, assassin by name and assassin by nature. So they have this... Big long mouthpiece. They're um, part of the hemitrium family, so they have piercing and sucking mouthparts, 
we call it a starless or a proboscis. And they're pretty brutal. Well, nature's pretty brutal. Um, a lot of these species will eat each other. They end up um, getting their prey, uh, stabbing it, pumping uh, this sal saliva that kind of liquefies the guts of the prey and then suck the guts out. So <laughs> it's pretty brutal. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and great. I couldn't uh, go on without mentioning green lacewings. They're really cool. Uh, they lay their eggs on stalks. Uh, so when they hatch, they're not going to be eaten by their brother or sister. And the silk produced is tougher than that produced by silkworms. Um, and they, the larva looked like little Pac-Man. I don't know if you remember the, the game. Um, we had one when I was young called Pac-Man, you know, with the mouth parts. And um, they'll go through chomping eggs and also soft-bodied insects. And they're also called junk bugs. Um, they've got these spines on their backs and they impale the bodies of their prey on their back. So they've got a snack for later. And it's also really <laughs> um, valuable camouflage as well. So you did ask the question, Abby. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Wow. A whole world out there. Um, yeah. And I love it. And I love your description of spiders because obviously most people are petrified of spiders. So you described them in, in a very loving way, which really reframed spiders for me. <laughs> um, um, okay, great. So just moving on. Uh, yeah, okay. So understanding, um, clearly understanding different type, types of plants and vertebrates, you know, and their role in this kind of wider infrastructure, this wider ecosystem is clearly really important. Um, and maybe I was just wondering, do you, from all your experience, do you have some examples of, or maybe one example of where this thinking was applied? Um, and, and maybe you could share share that. Sure. Um, we've got an eco grower called Dan Falkenberg, and I met Dan about 10 years ago and started working with him. And he and his father, Ian, really have helped pioneer the use of native grasses and forbs in Australian vineyards, but also have a, they have a really innate understanding of ecology. So they're based in the, uh, the Barossa wine region and they started uh, like a greenfield site about 20 or so years ago and their um, native plant community is a pepper box or a eucalyptus odorata woodland and they also planted a vineyard about the same time. So they started, you know, with nothing there. And what they've been able to subsequently do as those plants have started to grow and the understory is they've um, been able to attract a diversity of lizards, insectary birds, say so like grey fantails, woolly wagtails, um, superb blue fairy wrens, diamond firetail finches, and even a breeding pair of brown goshawks, which are birds of prey. It's pretty amazing. And they were running the vineyard pretty traditionally. Um, they say about probably 13 or 14 years ago were putting it in, in an annual triticale cover crop. And it was costing them about $615 a hectare. And they also had a problem with some invasive weeds like Salvation Jane, wireweed, evening primrose. And they also had a problem with light green apple moth uh, in their green ash. So they um, swapped across to a blend of um, four species of wallaby grass. And it cost them about $1,500 a hectare. So it costs more. But they were able to break even by year three. These wallaby grasses are self-regenerating perennial grasses. And what they're able to do is break that cycle of intervention, um, reducing fossil fuels. They didn't have to prep the area, um, compact the soil, get it ready for a seed bed every year. And by um, having these wallaby grasses established, they were able to outcomplete those weedy species. Uh, they were able to provide habitat for the predatory arthropods. We mentioned the brown lacewings and the wolf spiders before. So that they controlled the light brown apple moth problem. They didn't have to spray with insecticides. And from that point on, they were saving $615 a year, all by changing one practice. And they've been, they were able to reset the system for the next, de de sorry, the next decade uh, with ecological principles. So it worked really nicely. Yeah, that's yeah. an amazing example. Um, yeah, thank you for bringing that to life. That was brilliant. Mm. Um, so when we spoke uh, last week sometime, you told me that for 30 years, you've been waiting for there to be a greater appreciation of ecological practices um, in the way that we grow wine grapes. Um, and I know you mentioned at the beginning that you're, you have your own vineyard and, and that that's the bush vines with insectary plants planted between them. It's quite a, an experiment. I don't know if you want to say anything about that. Uh, sure. Um, on my own property, it's very small, but it's big enough to observe these benefits. And I don't have a lot of time. So it's a pretty hands-off project. 
because uh, I'm on the road a fair bit, but it's in like a natural bush block. Uh, there's a upper story of um, the stringy bark. So I've planted about um, a thousand native insectary plants. I thought I might call it in there about standing natural beauty like you have in the UK. I love that <laughs> term. <laughs> And uh, I've planted some bush vines. You wouldn't normally plant Chardonnay and Pinot, Pinot Noir as bush vines, but I have. And what I'm going to try and do is manage it um, as naturally as I can using compost tea, flavanol, flavanols, uh, biostimulants, so worm biocast, fish hydrosylate, fulvic humic acid, seaweed, rock dust, so forth. And um, try and increase the health of those vines so we get an increase in leaf bricks. And from what I understand, you can get, so if you get a leaf bricks of about 12 or higher, um, it's reported that plants are less likely to be uh, susceptible to insect attack and probably less issue with issues with diseases. So it's called the triphiobosis um, theory, uh, which is a pest starves on a healthy, healthy plant. Um, so I like breaking the rules and finding new solutions. So I'm giving it a go on my own block. Mm. No, it sounds great. Well, yeah, and I was... Um... Obviously, that's an amazing kind of experiment going forward. And it feels like that, you know, the Eco Vineyards program is also an expression of your 30 years of experience um, all coming together and then being able to share that much more widely. Um, so I would love for you to tell me a little bit about, you know, what is Eco Vineyards program? Sure. Um, over the last four years, we've been running uh, the Eco Vineyards program in South Australia. And we've set up uh, about 45 demonstration sites and we've just taken the program national in the last 12 months with the support of Wine Australia. So we've had just overwhelming support from wine growers um, who are really keen, you know, eager to learn. And we run events twice a year in each of the eight participating regions located um, in throughout Australia. Uh, we currently have three focus areas, which are soil health, ground covers, including cover crops and also functional biodiversity, which is all the wildlife found in association. Um, we've just published about 250 pages of materials uh, on the Eco Vineyards website. We've got a knowledge hub. Um, things uh, like how to do a biodiversity action plan, different native plant species lists for the different um, region, wine regions we're working in, and also soil health indicators for Australian vineyards, a booklet, uh, poster and a great Aussie earthworms count poster and also we've got a competition open at the moment um, so there's lots of resources there uh, we're working on some best practice management guides um, for each of those three areas and we'll then once we've got that peer-reviewed research captured as a living document we'll then pull out lots of fact sheets uh, and case studies from growers um, we're in the process of setting up 30 new demonstration sites um, and growers are really trialling uh, an interesting diversity of different things that haven't been done before, which is great. It's following a participatory action learning, um, which means that we're not waiting for peer reviewed research. We're setting up demonstration sites, seeing what works very quickly. And it's like a binary, yeah, the plant's alive or dead. And then we scale up from there. So we get information, you know, very quickly. EK growers receive um, a whole lot of complementary support from our regional on-ground coordinators and also um, microbat boxes. Microbats are pretty awesome. They're tiny, but they eat up to half their body weight in insects every night and they love eating moths. Uh, Raptor perches, again, to try and provide supplementary habitat to encourage them into the vineyards. Um, so, yeah, it's a great time to um, be working um, on uh, with a focus around environmental stewardship um, and we embrace all growers however they're currently growing um, and what we do is we will then um, provide an ecological focus so what we try and do is remove any um, barriers to uptake we want to accelerate practice change and um, we're working closely with growers to really empower them to find these answers for themselves and that creates a huge amount of goodwill um, we approach the sharing of knowledge with kindness and generosity, and we find that's reciprocated. So it's uh, reciprocity in action, which is lovely. Um, and yeah, we're really focused on um, things like um, there's a great, you know, kind of quote from Dr. Carl Huffaker at the University of California uh, when we kill off the natural enemies of a pest, we inherit their work. So we're wanting to look after those natural enemies. We've got thousands, millions of little workers that can do that work for us um, practically for free. 
And we also know that um, we need a, a minimum of 30% of original vegetation cover to stop species loss. So we're trying to um, really focus on ecological restoration with those fun functional benefits. Amazing. Um, and yeah, I mean, one of the things that really struck me also is just um, obviously you've trialed it in one location and then now you've been able to bring it to, uh, you know, across Australia um, and bringing, yeah, I guess it's just an amazing amount of knowledge and information and learning and, and sharing that so widely. And then, and then I guess learning from each other as well. It just seems like a really exciting way to approach this um, sharing of information and knowledge. So I'm ever impressed with Eco Vineyards um, and really <laughs> thank you for, for yeah, showing us all what's possible, I guess. Um, and maybe we can just dig into, I know you mentioned the three pillars there, um, but maybe we could just dig into those. And I don't know if you have any like specific case studies or uh, examples of, of what it looks like implementing those three pillars or how people are responding to them. I'm sure if we look at, say, um, ground covers, so we use ground covers instead of cover crops. So we want to get away from thinking about, uh, say, annual cover cropping. Um, move That's got a place too, but then move perhaps to more perennial cropping. Uh, the next stage on from that is multi-species mixes um, and then perhaps looking to those species that are also naturally adapted. Um, so, you know, there's a lot to kind of unpack there and there's some really nice research internationally where we know if we have a diversity of different families and a number of species within those families, we're going to get exponential benefits. Um, and we've also tried some of the species that might be really familiar to uh, you in Europe, like buckwheat, phacelia and alyssum. And they're really recognised for their superior provisioning services, but they're not always suited to our dry Aussie conditions. So, you know, we take the information that's out there and then we consider, you know, whether it's going to be, you know, really appropriate for us. And we also know that, um, you know, some of those species uh, can actually also harbour some of these pest species that we don't want to, you know, kind of have dominate. So um, it's important that we don't have these monocultures. The diversity is really the key. Um, but Adelaide Uni, work uh, by Dr. Tom Lyons, Tim, Tim Cavanaro, Joe Marks and um, Chris Penfold, they've been doing some long-term studies um, looking at the undervine area and we've now got results over a five-year period. Um, and, you know, they've been looking at a range of species like medican rye works really well, leguminous mixes with annual grasses works really well. Um, they've found that there can be some challenges with, say, coxfoot and fescue. They can reduce some of the vine vigour. And they've looked at wallaby grasses as well. So they've um, looked at the capacity of those plants to sequester carbon. They've found that you can get up to 23% more soil organic uh, carbon um, than a traditional, say, herbicide practice. And you can, say, more than double um, the microbial activity in those areas. And uh, Jeff Gerf from Charles Sturt University um, just looked at a range of different species, both commercial uh, co cover crops and also native species in the undermine area. And they found, um, you know, uh, creeping verbiella, which is Myopora and Parvifolium, um, provided really strong benefits to support populations of tricky gamma wasps. So we're, we're starting to get um, some really nice knowledge around some of these native species. And we're working with a whole range of uh, service providers to put in um, multi-species mixes of native grasses and forbs. So um, natives, um, um, native seeds in, sorry, setting natives in South Australia has a 17 species blend. Uh, we're working with um, native seeds in Victoria who are working on grasses and forbs as well. And we're also working with um, some of our existing eco growers to plant, uh, say, woody plants in the undervine area. There's a whole range of species that show real promise, um, species like the creeping verbiella, the myopora and parvifolium, uh, different species of gardenias, really prostrate growing. Uh, anything that grows less than 30 centimetres, we're interested to see how it goes. Uh, fan flowers, um, creeping saltbush, mun trees, and New Holland daisies, which are Visaginia species, look fabulous as well. Um, so there's lots of case studies in the Knowledge Hub. And if growers, uh, sorry, your um, listeners are interested in finding out more, um, they could look at, say, the Morella case study in Clear Valley for undervine plants, uh, the Falkenberg study in the Barossa or Naringa in the Adelaide Hills for native grasses. And Naringa was doing um, uh, preparation in an organic biodynamic vineyard. 
And the grindstone vineyard in Rattenbully was using hydra mulch, uh, hydra seeding, which is liquid mulch, to be able to spray seed in the undervine area. So we're keen to see uh, what technology is out there and how we can apply it to um, some of our trickier questions where we don't have uh, ready-made solutions or equipment, say, that will get the seed in the undervine area as readily as we might like. So, yeah, so because earlier you did mention that like 100% ground cover is the is one of the focuses of the eco vineyards um mm. approach and so yeah so you're talking there about both intervine but also uh, you know undervine that you would literally have uh cover the whole everywhere in the vineyard would be a living root at all times ideally absolutely and we're also looking at how we can establish vineyards uh differently by having a full ground cover of native grasses and forbs there and then planting into them as well so again we don't have to keep chasing our tails trying to do weed control keep a bare soil nature will always you know fill a void so we'd like to fill it with something functional um that's going to work well for us but i mean i think this will literally be putting the uh fear of life into most viticulturalists because this is definitely going against the grain of of common understanding of, of of you know the the how the vineyard works and how to protect the vines and yeah how how do you deal with with that or what would you say to someone who's like whoa 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 <laughs> yeah I think you know we we can't use the same thinking to try and fix some of the mistakes that we've made in the past we need new thinking um, some of the practices aren't working for us anymore. Um, we don't have a lot of, uh, say, viticultural folk that have also got an underpinning around ecology. So I think that's a great opportunity for us to really embrace ecologists in production landscapes as well. And um, essentially, we're wanting the same outcomes. We want to produce really awesome quality, you know, fruit and to do it as uh, cheaply um, and as cost effectively as we can. So I always say to those growers that are worried about changing practices where they're already producing really good quality fruit, Imagine how much better it can be. <laughs> it's not necessarily going to be a negative. Maybe we can take it a whole, you know, to a whole new level. Um, so I see, um, you know, that now we're probably at the most exciting time of growing wine grapes, certainly in my career. Um, we're challenging some of those established practices and looking for new solutions. And I find that really exciting. Yeah. And I think, I guess for me, part of the power of the eco vineyards and the eco growers as examples is that um you're not just talking about it you're actually you're implementing these things like people can go and read the case studies and look at how it's worked in other places um so obviously you can't say it's going to work exactly like this on every site because that's not how it goes um but certainly you're you've got a lot of examples of how it has worked and then that's a much easier place for people to experiment from so i think that's yeah really important um okay so one of the questions I wanted to ask also was, um, uh, yeah, when we spoke the other day, you also had some thoughts on kind of the missed connections between different parts of the system. So, uh, you know, when people don't approach this, the vineyard within that ecological mindset you were just talking about, um, sometimes things can be caused to skew in a direction without people realizing. Um, and you gave the example of the overuse of sulfur in the vineyard and people not realizing just what a damaging effect that can have on other parts of the system. So maybe you could just tell me a, a bit more about that. Yeah, I think um, sometimes there can be unintended consequences. So um, traditionally growers will use pretty high sulfur rates, 600 grams, you know, around the beginning of the, around woolly bud. And um, we just need to be mindful that sometimes that can knock out um, some of the um, predators that we want to actually look after, like parasitic wasps, the predatory mites associated, say, beneficial insects, which might otherwise provide biocontrol of pest mites, scale, mealybugs, and also light brown apple moth. And there's a nice little story I like to tell, which came, comes from Mount Majura, actually, um, around um, close to Canberra. And they had a problem with scale. And um, what they did is they got some um, some native ladybird larva called Cryptolemus, and they replaced, you know, they put those, released those um, ladybird larva uh, into the vineyard, and they were able to, you know, help uh, control the immature scale. They established really nicely, and um, they were really um, worried about this problem with um, scale on the, you know, mature scale uh, persisting in the vineyard. 
and they got a local researcher to come out. And what they actually found was there was all these holes in the um, in the the scale, and they found that they'd been naturally parasitized. And the one practice that they changed was instead of using high rates of sulfur, is they used um, you know other ways of uh, other synthetic chemistry to be able to control powdery mildew. And in doing so, just by changing that practice, they found that the biocontrol worked for them. You know, they didn't have to intervene. Um, and there's a range of, I guess, ways that we can grow the, 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 the health of the plants. I mentioned before, you know, using flavanols and other biostimulants to try and build the health of the vines. Um, you know, the use of sulfur is there because, you know, it's a really cheap option, but we sometimes need to think about the opportunity cost attached with that. And um, it's a great fungicide, but if you spray it, you know, so that it hits the, the ground, um, you know, we're going to potentially knock out populations of mycorrhizal and sacrificy, you know, fungal populations. They're needed for quorum sensing and for um, health of the microbiome in the soil. Um, we need mycorrhizal fungi because they produce glomelin, which is like a soil super glue. And, um, you know, that... Um, is able to store 27% um, um, soil carbon, say compared to humic acid, which is about eight. So, you know, it will increase the soil water hold, uh, the, sorry, or, uh, soil organic carbon by, you know, more than three times. And we also need uh, fungi to help um, drought proof our soils. Um, and also moving away from bare earth, uh, especially with the possible El Nino conditions that are forecast. So I'd like to challenge some of those assumptions that bare soil is best. Um, I think, you know, there's um, some really good knowledge out there that just demonstrates all of the benefits when you have um, the soil covered, including, you know, reducing the temperature of the soil by, say, 20 degrees um, Celsius, <laughs> you know, on really hot days and keeping that transpiration happening. And we also talk about decarbonising. I think what we need to really do is think about how we can um, really um, repair that soil water sponge. And that's got the capacity to influence, um, say, 95% of a lever that we can pull in terms of reducing, um, you know, the, the, the global warming that we're seeing. So, you know, having those plants on the ground is a really important part of that. And there's so many other benefits that also flow from having um, cover on the soil. Mm. Yeah, totally. And just to dive into the sulfur question, because someone, uh, we had some questions in advance on this, um, you know, what does sulfur do to beneficial insects? You talk about it being a fungicide, but what does it do to beneficial insects? And is there like a, a limit and, and you go over the limit and then you have a more negative effect on insects or yeah, any sense around that? Yeah, it will um, have a, a negative impact quite often on the beneficial insects, but also perhaps on the earthworms in the soil and so forth. So we want to try and keep um, the rate um, below 400 grams per 100 litres if possible and focus on a true IPM approach where um, we're looking at cultural and biocontrol options first and then chemical control options as a last resort and only as required rather than at the front end. And just having that holistic approach, opening up the canopies, um, you know, is part of how we can have a more holistic approach to some of these, um, you know, um, approaches to um, controlling insects and, and diseases. Yeah. Okay. Got you. Great. Um, okay. And then I have, um, oh, yeah, th that. Uh, that was Adriana, I think. She did also have a question about, um, you know, do you have any resources for spray regimes in areas that are higher rainfall, cool climate areas? So like Victoria or also like the United Kingdom. <laughs> um, I think it is a really tough one um, where you've got, yeah, higher, um, you know, a lot more rainfall and where you might have conditions which are conducive to um, powdery or downy mildew. Um, also, I was uh, listening to uh, a webinar that I think you're on, Abby, with um, um, a colleague of yours as well. And um, um, that person was talking about the fact that you can have hedgerows of um, um, oregano and the volatiles oh, yeah. from the oregano um, can help to um, disrupt um, or provide illicit responses like jasmonic uh, acid responses from the grapevine, which will actually reduce its susceptibility to, to say, um, downy mildew, which 
I found fascinating. So, you know, some of these plant responses are pretty fascinating. If a plant is coming under attack, you've got chewing damage from, say, like Branaphomoth on a berry. It puts out, say, this jasmonic um, acid signal, um, which will then attract the parasitic wasps um, that can then start to parasitise um, some of the caterpillars that are eating it. So, yeah, there's some fantastic solutions out there um, that might be part of an integrated approach. Amazing. Um, you have to think who that was. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, okay, and then just one final question from me, and then I'll go to some of the questions from people uh, who have been listening along. Um, my final question is just from, you know, of course, uh, as I said in the beginning, you know, we're, as a business, we're committed to ecology, profitability, and beauty. So we've mainly been focusing on the ecology. You did reference a little bit about the profitability side or the financial side. Um, <clears throat> and I just wanted to hear from you, you know, how does this all affect the profitability of the vineyards you're working with? And, and what have you seen through the Eco Growers Program? Because I know there is quite a bit of um, reporting there on this kind of stuff. Yeah, I think, you know, just by virtue of the fact we're setting ourselves up for longer term benefits means that we're not having to intervene as often. And, um, you know, if we can break that cycle of intervention, we're saving time and resources. So, you know, there's benefits there. Um, we find that um, many of the growers that have insectary plantings or growing organically don't have to intervene with insecticides at all. So that's a pretty easy win. You know, we've got pretty good confidence in that area um, that we can get benefits. And we know that if we plant say, every 10th row with insectary plants or every 25 metres, that's enough to provide biological control of, say, like Branaphomoth, that's work that was done in, in New Zealand. Uh, I gave the example with, say, Dan, um, instead of spending $615 per hectare per year, you know, he was able to uh, break even by year three and then save that money in perpetuity thereafter. Um, we find that um, Botrytis and other bunch rots cost us about $52 million a year and like Brad Affermoth, about $18 million a year in Australia. So that's a $70 million saving nationally if we can uh, reduce the um you know, the prevalence uh, or abundance of light brain alpha moth. Um, so we know that we can do that with confidence uh, with some of these practices. Um, and we also know that um, where we've got uh, biodiversity and this provision of ecosystem services, um, you know, the benefits can be improved by at least 20% in vineyards. Um, where we've got, say, an intero vegetation cover um, in preference to, um, you know, bare earth. Um, we know that mycorrhizal fungi can supply up to 90% of plant um, pl a plant's um, plant available nitrogen and phosphorus requirements. Um, for every 1% of soil um, carbon that's increased, we can store an extra 144,000 litres of water per hectare every time it rains. Um, we know that it's estimated that 90, 98% of sprayed insecticides and 95% of herbicides miss their intended target. So, you know, there's lots of um, upside to some of these practices. And as we're getting more confident, um, we're doing the cost and benefit. So each of our case studies has all of the financials so that everyone can see transparently what we've done and what the benefits are. Mm, brilliant. Thank you. Um, yeah, I feel like we are super aligned in that profitability, ecology and beauty. Like they're all coming together in the work that you're doing. And that's just so exciting to see. Um, yeah. So I want to just go to a few questions. Um, first question I'm going to ask is from Inti, which says, why do you particularly want insectary plants that flower at a similar time to the vines? Um, what we want to do is have uh, plants that flower all year round. So that's important right through the overwintering period as well, where it might be, um, you know, the life cycles might be slowing down. We want to have plants really early in the spring, late in winter in, in particular, because that's when the life cycle of the, um, the insects will start to really ramp up. Many of them are very related to heat degree days and heat units in, in terms of how quickly their life cycles will go and how many um, cycles they'll have in terms of breeding cycles in a year. So we actually want to have plants all year round, but what we're focusing on is that really critical time in grapevines where we have flowering so that we can try and keep those inflorescences clean. And um, that is 
in regard particularly to um, light brown apple moth, just after flowering, we then find uh, mealy bug can be an issue. What happens though is the bunches started, start to close. Um, we have less options uh, in terms of the chemicals that we might be able to use for intervention because of uh, MRLs. And um, those bunches then become much difficult, much more difficult to get those sprays into. Of course, insects can go in there, no worries at all. So we've got that benefit. So we are looking for um, a range of species um, that will provide habitat for a range of insects all the way through the year. And um, not just at that, that grapevine flowering period, but of course that period from flowering right through to harvest is a really critical time to make sure that we're on the front foot. We've got the populations um, of predatory arthropods high enough so that they can provide that natural biological control and we don't have those outbreaks of some of the pest species uh, that can then cause economic damage. Got it. Thank you. Um, okay, great. And I've got a few questions from David Lowe, um, which says, he asked, is there a native grape used for wine? Um, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't um, either. I think... <laughs> I think there are some um, some some native species uh, in Australia, um, not of Vitis vinifera, but um, there might be um, some other, you know, kind of berry species that you could potentially make some wine from. David, I look forward to um, talking with you further about those possibilities. <laughs> yeah, I mean that could be very creative. What I could say is um, we do have some native plants that are quite aromatic. So we have one producer, uh, Bremerton Wines in Langhorne Creek, that is using um, some native um, lemongrass as a botanical in um, making gin. Mm. <laughs> um, so we do have some other nice, you know, synergies which are just naturally occurring. So, um, um, yeah, we might have our own Eco Vineyards gin down the track as well. <laughs> Perfect. Um, and then he has other questions. So... Oh, one more question here. Um, yeah, so I guess I kind of did cover this, but he, you know, he said, but the traditional knowledge is that anything growing under the vine hosts pests that then crawl into the vines. Yeah, um, there is a bit of, uh, there are some misnomers and one of them is that, you know, those plants will draw down on the, the bigger of vines. We might find that in say year one, if you're setting up a perennial, but we find that that then um, becomes a positive, you know, at least by year three to year five. Um, we also find that those plants are able to actually hold more water at depth. We found this at the Eden Hall vineyard where they had, you know, empty dams and that was their only source of irrigation water for about three years running. Um, so we're able to kind of, um, you know, broaden out our knowledge and discussion uh, around some of these topics. And yes, I'd say if you have a monoculture of an introduced species, quite often you do get an unwanted uh, wanted pest. Um, if you have um, a diversity of native species, what we find, this is through my work and also Dr. Louis uh, Matter's work, he looked at pollinators, is you get um, a benefit uh, if you're using um, species which are native, say, to Australia, but you get an exponential benefit if you use species which are local to your particular area as well. And if we have that diversity of species, we don't tend to get a uh, pest, uh, might be weeds or insects dominating. That's how ecology works. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, just again, um, you know, having uh, picking the appropriate species is really important. And again, not going in and just replacing, you know, what you've got with another monoculture is equally as important. Got it. Thank you. Um, OK, and now I've got a question from Charles Lewis. Um, which says they planted a vineyard in Essex in 2021 and they're interested to find out about natural plant species that would work well in between the vines. Um, is there a good plant species resource for, for the UK like eco vineyards? Um, and it'd be great to know what flora and grasses would be good to plant here. Um, um, yeah, perhaps talk to your colleagues, uh, Alistair Nesbitt and Vinescapes. I did a report for them a couple of years ago, which was looking at the Kent Downs area of natural um, beauty <laughs> yeah and uh, they were interested in this particular question so I put together quite a, a detailed resources a literature review uh, which included um, many of the uh, fauna that you'd found in that local area as well as the types of species appropriate to the UK that might be appropriate to trial and of course you have these amazing natural um, grass you know kind of um, wildlife um, wildflower fields that you have there 
Um, and you've actually got fantastic resources to draw on there. You know, you're well equipped to be able to tap into and trial some of these new species in the UK. Mm. Yeah. Um, well, that's an amazing uh, indicate uh, pointing us to a resource because uh, you did mention that once, but I haven't followed up on it. So I need to uh, go and ask Alistair about that resource or the Vinescapes team. Um, it's about that's... it's available online, so we can okay. Um, we can okay, we link. can share it. Okay, we'll share the link after this um, in the follow up email. Um, and yeah, I think it's a great question, Charles. And I'd also like to encourage we need to find the people in the UK doing more of that research as well. Um, and Charles had some more questions down here quickly. Oh, uh, yeah. What what was the recommended limit for spraying sulfur that you mentioned earlier? It was four hundred gram per hundred liters. Is that correct? That's yes. correct. Correct. Yep. Okay, great. And then are there any alternatives to sulfur sprays? Um, Charles has heard of spraying whey, um, or he says that apparently lowers the pH level on the leaf, um, makes mildew harder to form. What do you think? Yeah, um, Dr. Peter Crisp uh, did some work about 10 years ago at Temple Brewer uh, Winery in Langhorn Creek looking at uh, milk whey, and um, it uh, worked really well, but of course you need to put it on pretty regularly. So, you know, that's part of the challenge. Um, also, I've heard that flavanols can work really well just to be able to build the plant health and uh, potentially reduce susceptibility to some of these diseases. Um, I'm not sure that there's peer-reviewed uh, research, um, you know, to support those claims, but certainly there's a lot of growers who anecdotally um, have observed some benefits. Got it. Thank you. And then, okay, Oh my, everyone's piling in the questions at the end. Jeez, okay, let's go. Um, Becky Sykes, are any regions too arid to enable ground cover to establish? Uh, no, I think uh, we had Dr. Mary Cole speak um, as a part of our initial round of soil health um, uh, events. And uh, she's done a lot of work in the United Arab Emirates uh, right through Africa, looking at ways to be able to build um, soil um uh, organic matter and to be able to also vegetate um you know ground covers so again you'd go to native species um you know you'd need to select very carefully but there's ways and means of being able to overcome some of those challenges and in fact to be able to reverse the effects of some of the desertification sometimes that's a cultural change you know it does take a leap of faith and it does take um, different thinking to be able to move through what some of those practices entrenched practices um, have meant to get to that point. Um, but certainly it is possible to make uh, gains where you have very low rainfall of less than 250 or 200 mils, you know, per annum. Okay, great. Um, and then a follow-up to the sulfur question from Will Perkins, which is that does potassium bicarbonate have any impacts on insects or arthrop arthropods as an alternative to sulfur? Um, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I haven't looked into it, so I'm happy to take that on notice and um, we might that in, add that in uh, when we do the functional biodiversity in our third year of the program. Um, I can add that into one of the uh, questions that we answer. Mm, great. A new experiment. Thanks, Will. Um, <laughs> okay, final <laughs> question from Augustus. What is the best solution for powdery mildew during fruit, fruit cluster development, in your opinion? Um. I think, again, that's a tricky one. Uh, we know that sulfur works really well. We need to start early with sulfur. And, uh, you know, if you kind of get to cluster development and you've got a raging powdery issue, it's because it's um, occurred really early in the season. Um, it's not, you know, something that you can really tackle effectively late in the season. So you need to start early and regularly in terms of staying on top of powdery mildew. Mm. Um, and again, just looking at how we can build um, resilience within those vines, open up the canopy, look at the cultural practices. I don't know that I've got any silver bullets, but, um, you know, it's a combination of all of those things and understanding, you know, the environmental conditions and the life cycle of the disease. Yeah. And I guess that's the beauty of everything you've been saying is that there is no silver bullet. It is about all of the interactions and, you know, that IPM approach of sometimes you do use some chemistry if you need it. And sometimes you will have to use sulfur. Um, and but by providing the resilience of this wider uh, ecological uh, interwoven system, um, you're moving away from over reliance on that, basically, and really reducing the need. And, and that's. That's kind of where we're all headed, hopefully. 
Yeah, always buffering. If you do need to use herbicide, you might be able to add in some, you know, fulvic acid to reduce the, the rate. You might get better efficacy and you're also feeding the microbes at the same time. So they'll bounce, bounce back more quickly. Um, so, you know, always just looking at the ways that we can, um, yeah, integrate, um, you know, that, that ecological approach. And, um, you know, that's sometimes embracing the chemistry where we need to, but um, having a safeguard approach there so that we can let that system recover um, quickly wherever possible. Got it. Great. Thank you so much, Mary. That was brilliant. Um, as everyone I'm sure who's watching can tell, uh, you have a wealth of knowledge and we've only just touch the tip of that. Um, so definitely encourage everyone to go to the Eco Vineyards website. I think from my from what I've seen, even if, you know, I'm not farming in an Australian landscape, but to me, the the wealth of information there, it's it's kind of just helping us to understand the experiments that are going on. And and I do think we everyone can learn from them um, and then you know apply it in our own location. So yeah, that's an amazing resource. Thank you for bringing that together. And I encourage everyone to go check it out. We will send links in the follow-up email here. Um, and also for those who are closer to home for you, um, there's lots of uh, events coming up in the spring um, and post-vintage each year. So please do go check those out and feel, you know, attend events if you can. I won't be coming, sadly. but um, <laughs> <laughs> And just, I guess, thank you so much, Mary. Thank you for all your sharing. Um, for anyone who's listening who is interested to hear more about what we do at Sector Mentor, you can send us a direct message in the chat or email info at vdecycle.com. Um, and yeah, we'll send a follow-up email early next week, or actually maybe this week, um, with a video of the recording and links to where you can find out more about what Mary's doing. Um, and if you enjoyed this, head to our website and you can check out the previous regenerative viticulture series in the articles and case study section. So. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Um, really appreciate it. And uh, thank you so much, Mary, for all thank of you. Thank you, Abby. And we'd love to um, really welcome any of your listeners to the Eco Vineyards community. Uh, lots of resources on Eco Vineyards website, ecovineyards.com.au, and also on the socials on Facebook and Instagram. So we don't have all the solutions, but collectively, by sharing that knowledge, I think we can come up with, um, with new solutions, which is really exciting. And we are really dedicated to sharing those insights in real time so that everyone benefits. Mm, yeah. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks, Abby. All right. Toodaloo.